welcome to this session of uh, uh, IACC Jharkhand chapter on uh, uh, legal implications on Indo-US bilateral trade. And uh, I, bef before we go ahead with this entire session, I'll request our immediate past chairman, uh, Mr. Nakul Kamani, uh, to formally uh, give a welcome address and uh, if, uh, uh, you know, welcome all the participants and the speakers on this particular occasion. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Commander Sanjeev Raman, uh, Chairman of the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce, Jaka Chapter, uh, Mr. Sharad Chandra Nair, the Chairman of the Events Committee, Mr. Rajiv Agarwal, Advocate, Mr. Dilip Goel, Vice Chairman, Mr. Gyan Taneja, Vice Chairman, uh, esteemed speakers, Mr. Manish Biala from Anand and Anand, Mr. Varghese Matthews from Fox Mandar and Associates, Mr. Sonal Mishra from LS Tower and Company, uh, our officers and office bearers from the regional office, Mr. R.K. Chacher, who is the regional president, Calcutta, Eastern India region, Mr. Sagar Kadam of the Indo-American Chamber head office, Madhushri Dayatri, who is our consultant and who helps in all the programs. Uh, this webinar is on the legal implications in Indo-US bilateral trade. Uh, as I was just talking offline to uh, Mr. Matthews, there is a huge implication today uh, with counterfeiters, and unlike the old days when, let's say, cinemas, pictures, movies were uh, made into CDs and DVDs, and the quality was obviously so poor, now you have counterfeiters who are making, let us say, uh, Gucci handbags. Now, Gucci handbags cost maybe eight to ten thousand dollars. And the cheap imitations, well, not cheap imitations, but the imitations which are being made, uh, particularly in some of these countries like China, they are so good that the originals, they need to go and actually count the number of threads and number of stitches to be able to figure out which is the original and which is a fake. So the entire system has become so sophisticated and which is why there are so many legal implications, particularly in the area of bilateral trade. And I am delighted that we have three experts, Mr. Biala, Mr. Matthews, and Mr. Mishra, who are going to talk on various areas and aspects, such as trademarks and uh, protection. I would also like to welcome uh, from XLRI, the Center for Public Policy and Research team, uh, members and the participants and students from XLRI, NIT, Amity, and Sant Longeval University, members of IACC from Jharkhand, members from the CII, Rotary, and various other professional bodies who have uh, registered for this program. This is likely to be a very interesting program. And unlike other programs which start at two o'clock in the afternoon, I doubt I will find anybody snoozing because it's going to be interesting as well. I do hope that you will make full use of today's program. Listen carefully to all these three speakers. They are young, they have ideas, they have knowledge, and they are ready to share that with you. And I do hope that you enjoy this program. My best wishes. Once again, all of you, a very warm welcome on behalf of the Indo-American Chamber, the Jharkhand Chapter. Thank you. Back to you, Commander Raman. Thank you, Munakul Bhai. Uh, you have always uh, done this for us to initiate the, the process. And uh, if the initiation is right, the end always culminates in the, in the, in the good way. We have, uh, we always wanted uh, uh, that uh, whatever we do in IACC, we need, uh, we should involve students because they are the future. And fortunately, in most of our, of our programs, XLRI has been partnering with us. 
This time we have the Center for Public Policy and Research and uh, Mr. Shumam is there from XLRI student body and uh, they, uh, they do a lot of work but exactly what CPPR does, I would like uh, Mr. Shubham to throw some light on their activities and uh, I'm sure that the student community will benefit from this particular session. Yes, uh, Shubham, over to you. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Shubham Singh and I'm a business management student at XLRI Jamshedpur. As a member of a Committee of Public Policy Research, CPPR at XLRI, I am honored to introduce our committee to the esteemed attendees of the seminar on the legal implication of Indo-US bilateral trades conducted by Indo-American Chamber of Commerce. About CPPR, which is established in 2017, CPPR serves as XLRI's hub for discussions and dialogues on public policy and governance. Our flagship event, Niti Manthan, has gained national recognition for fostering insightful conversations on public policy matters, featuring distinguished speakers such as Srimati Medha Patkar, Chief Information Commissioner Sri uh, Yashwardhan Sinha, Chief Economic Advisor Sri uh, Dr. Uh, Anant Nageshwaran, and former IAS Officer Anil Saru, and others. At CPPR, we aim to bridge the gap between business and public leadership, fostering collaboration for effective policy making. Our initiatives are dedicated to reconciling diverse leader, leader, leadership realms, nurturing future managers with a strong orientation towards public policy and contributing to society, societal betterment through informed decision making. We believe in empowering future leaders to address pressing socioeconomic and policy issues through critical thinking and engagement with influential personalities. I thank IACC and Sanjeev sir for providing this opportunity to engage and hear the learned panelists on such an important topic. We, student of XLRI, look forward to a meaningful discussion and an insightful uh, seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Shubham. And uh, actually, as we were formalizing the entire event, we realized and uh, uh, that uh, as the globalization, uh, the world is moving towards a very globalization era. So there will be impacts and challenges of technology and digital media, which will come, you know, along the way and more and more, it will get more and more complex in future. And uh, when I was going through the profile of all these speakers, I, I, I really was very, very surprised that it's no more uh, a very, I would say, uh, a lawyer area of work because there is so much of technicalities involved into this. So we'll start with the very first speaker, uh, Mr. Sonal Bishra from LS Dabur and Company, and uh, he would be speaking on patenting. And I take this opportunity to introduce Mr. Sonal Bishra. Mr. Sonal Bishra is a partner and patent attorney with LS Dabur and Company. He's having over 10 years of experience in patent industry. He holds a Bachelor of Engineering in Electronics and Communication from VTU Bangalore, Master of Technology uh, in Power Electronics and Electrical Rights from IIT ISM Dhanbad, Bachelor of Law from IIT Kharagpur, and Master of Law from Jindal Global Law School. Uh, he applies his techno legal background in electrical, electronics, mechanical, ICT, software and other high-tech technologies for patent matters. He practices, his practice encompasses myriad aspects of patent laws with an emphasis on the patent analytics, drafting, prosecutions, patent litigations, client counseling, and advisory on patent protection, commercialization, and litigation strategies. He comes from a strong techno-legal background with specialization in handling uh, clients across multiple Industries including software, clean energy, and renewables, steel, mining, automobiles, and many more. And he has demonstrated experience. He has demonstrated experience in drafting and prosecuting patent applications, particularly for INPTO, EPO, and USPTO. Currently, he is managing a wide variety of portfolio, including patent draftings and prosecutions, freedom to operate studies, advisory 
on international patents filing strategies, licensing support, IP transactional agreements, standard essential uh, patents, and you know the list is endless. I can go on and on. So I would uh, say that yes, welcome, Mr. Sonal Mishra. I'm sure that with your you know techno commercial and the legal uh, uh, background, we all will benefit, and we all, particularly I, certainly will benefit because I also have one very small question to ask, which we'll discuss in the later chapter. So I would request you to kindly speak on patenting and enlighten us on on this aspect of patent laws. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Aman, uh, for the wonderful invitation and introduction. And uh, it's an honor to be part of the panel, especially with a few of the colleagues from uh, the law firms. And uh, like Doc, like Mr. Kamani just mentioned, uh, there is no Modi ki guarantee that people wouldn't snooze. Uh, because, you know, when you're starting off uh, with patents, uh, I would say it's the least uh, interested, interesting subject among the uh, subjects which we are discussing today, but the most important one. If uh, our country is to become innovation driven economy, probably patenting ecosystem has to evolve. The innovation ecosystem has to evolve. So it could be the least interesting, but the most VIP among the IPs, which we are going to discuss today. So, you know, with this background, uh, I would like to start with a few numbers. And it's important, you know, because our current government is also a huge uh, fan of numbers. So, that would make more sense and put everything in perspective. Uh, so we all know that India is the biggest, uh, largest partner uh, for US when it comes to bilateral trade. And uh, uh, the numbers have gone up to around 191 billion in the past financial year, and that is humongous. So naturally, uh, the investment and trade is among uh, the top, if you were to consider US as a reference point. And that is going to, that is slated to you know, even go up, especially in the past eight to 10 years. There have been a lot of uh, changes which have been introduced uh, on the legislative front, judicial front, or regulatory front. And, you know, which has certainly helped increase uh, the faith of the investors in India, the companies who are you know, operating in India. So that has certainly helped. So, like I said, $191 billion of trade between the two countries in the last financial year. And then if you talk about innovation index, according to World IP uh, Intellectual Property Organization, India is sitting at 40th stop, uh, spot, or rather 40, 40th spot when it comes to uh, the innovation index. And just to think, uh, put things in perspective, uh, this number will make more sense because around 2015, India was sitting at 81th spot and now it is moved to 40th spot. So certainly, you know, there's a huge jump in there. Now, uh, around 90,000 90, patents have been filed in the past financial year, which was around 66,000 in, in the financial year 22-23. So now it has also gone up. And for the probably for the first time, the filings, the patent filings by the Indian resident applicants, which includes both the natural person or the juristic person or the companies. So the Indian resident filings have also gone up, which was never the case. Right. And when we talk about the grant numbers, the patent being granted in one year, in the last financial year, that is around 1 lakh, 100,000 patents were granted last year. And again, which this will make more sense, if you look at the number penultimate year, I mean the year previous to the current financial year, it was around 34,000. And it has jumped to 1 lakh in this year, which has also surpassed the US. And if you wish to calculate that on the percentage front, you would know that there is a huge, huge jump. So certainly, you know, there is a uh, upgrade in terms of a lot of things. If you talk about modernization of IP office, uh, increase in manpower and stuffing, uh, the patent office or the intellectual property office has now become digitized. Is we need to e-file all the applications. The hearing happens virtually. There are expedited examinations of these applications which are put in place. There are category of applications, applicant, applicants defined which can now avail discounted fees. And some of these are also applicable to foreign entities like startup or education institutions. So, you know, 
India has also now sort of considered uh, that investment to encourage investment to also have to extend these benefits to entities outside India. That is one part. Now let us come to uh, different statements being issued by uh, different organizations like uh, last year around January, uh, you would know better that around the, it was the 13th ministerial uh, meeting uh, between the India and US TPF, Trade Policy Front. And uh, the joint statement which was uh, published after the conclusion of the meeting was that India is doing a lot to improve on the enforcement front particularly. Plus, when it comes to disclosure of your confidential business information in terms of working statement, which is a requirement uh, at the patent office, even there, India has probably progressed and moving towards uh, what the US wants or many developed economies would want. So India has also moved towards that model. And uh, if you talk about other procedural issues, like, you know, there are patent oppositions where you oppose the granted patent just to ensure that only good patents are granted. Even on that front, the country or the laws are moving towards streamlining the process or simplifying the process. Plus, I just spoke about the modernization of, of uh, IP officers, staffing and simplifying the process, digitizing the whole system. Mm, there are good things you know, which are happening and also been recognized like I said in the uh, joint statement issued by the US TPF, India US TPF. So ideally, uh, so it appears that everything is hunky dory, uh, you know, it's all going great. But then if you actually delve into uh, the actual problem uh, on ground, you would realize that there are certain issues which are, you know, pain points and outstanding. So ideally, a developed economy like the US when trading with, uh, you know, a country like India, which is a huge market, what would be the expectation or what would be the general consideration on the kind of IPR regime they would want? So the kind of IPR regime US would want or any developed country dealing with India would want is again IPR. What does it mean? It means that the system that the IPR regime should be IPR, indiscriminatory, predictable and reliable. So as long as the country ensures that your regime is predictable, reasonable and applied uniformly, including you know, consistency at multiple fronts, then certainly that model is suited for you know, uh, better investment, better business and will instill confidence in the uh, foreign investors or foreign companies operating in India or willing to operate in India at a later point of time. So you know, just, just a context. That's how, you know, an ideally a country would want things to run. So, like I said, despite these statements, which are encouraging uh, in different uh, forums from the uh, US agencies or US uh, and India government uh, uh, panels. So still India is, if you were to talk about 2023, uh, there's an annual report released by the uh, US government, uh, agency of the US government. Uh, USTR, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the report is called Special 301, Special 301. And India has been in the list, on the priority watch list of that Special 301 for many years now. And still it continues to be on that list. So that list ideally would have countries which do not have adequate protection for IPR. So those countries will feature on that list. India is there on the list. It continues to be on that list along with China and Russia and other few countries. So if we have to now discuss and, you know, I'll, I'll obviously in the positive, there's a paucity of time. So I'll uh, just scratch the surface. But I'm sure people who are not into patents or do not uh, have a lot of practical idea about uh, the relationship between US and India in terms of IPR or other regulatory uh, concerns. So US is always concerned about pharmaceutical and probably you know, software, pharmaceutical primarily, pharmaceutical and medical devices, because India public interest health is paramount. And India is, uh, uh, you know, so to speak, India is the pharmacy of the world. So 
there are a lot of generic companies who operate in here. There are a lot of generic uh, uh, medicines which are rolled out before the patent on that drug expires sometimes and sometimes after the patented drug expires. So ideally, generic drug, uh, by definition, is you can manufacture a generic drug upon, upon necessary approvals after the patent on that particular drug expires. Okay. So that happens now. What happens? India has a lot of policies, a lot of regulatory uh, you know, checks and balances when it comes to these uh, giving approvals to these uh, uh, medical devices or pharmaceutical compounds. I'm, I don't know if you have uh, followed this judgment from the Supreme Court of India uh, a few years back, which was a very famous Novartis versus Union of India. What happened? It was a cancer drug, imanitib, imatinib. There is a section under the Indian Patents Act, which is called Section 3D. Section 3D. So it deals with patentable subject matter as to what is allowed under the Patent Act, Patents Act and what is not allowed under the Patent Act. Section 3 deals with it. And there are multiple you know, uh, subsections. So Section 3D is one of them. So according to Section 3D, and as interpreted by the Supreme Court of India, the court said in its uh, opinion and order that any incremental invention, any improvement to the pharmaceutical drug, pharmaceutical patent wouldn't be allowed unless there is an enhanced efficacy. So what happened? Any drug manufacturer, apart from generic, will have a blockbuster drug. Of course, no, at least I just mentioned imatinib. There will be, the, the patent term is for 20 years and just before the expiry, they'll un file another patent under a category which is called patent of addition, maybe, or another patent. They'll tell, they'll tell that there is an improvement, a minor improvement. And so, under a GAB, they will extend the patent term. So, the monopoly will be extended. And so, for a country like India, that drug will still continue to be very expensive. So, the court said, categorically, that such patents cannot be allowed to extend the monopoly. And US, uh, from day one, is, has not liked the stance of the government and the courts that such incremental invention should be allowed so that these benefits should reach the patients in India and also this curbs the innovation. So that has this that is the stand of the US government and which is why primarily India features on that list or the priority watch list which is released by the USTR every year as special 301. So that is one part. The other if you talk about other issues India also controls the prices of drugs just again you know that public interest comes in so the prices of drugs are still controlled although there is an act which is passed by the uh, government notified by the government which is called drug controls act or price control act uh, where they say that for a new drug which is patented for five years uh, uh, into the life cycle no price control would be applied but the concern of the u.s government concern of the relevant government of the U.S. is that the implementation is not very clear. We do not know how this is going to be implemented. So certainly that still remains the pain point. Although there is an act now that for a new drug, five years, there will be no price control. Okay. Now if we talk about little, you know, legality front, because it is important, protection is right, like you just discussed a couple of things that, you know, on the perspective, on the a front of the intellectual property office, be it manpower or digitization, expedited examination, multiple rules, which makes things you know more simpler in nature. Apart from that, this is all you know respect to protection front. But then again, there is an enforcement. If there is an infringement, which I think uh, Mr. Kamani was talking about, if there is an infringement, how do you uh, tackle it? If we have to enforce it through courts, so the courts have to be you know prepared the courts have to deal with this in a time bound manner with these such infringement suits with such infringement actions so certainly commercial courts act which was notified in 2015 and later amended in 2018 which deals with commercial matters and for all practical purposes patents are considered now considered as commercial matters because it involves commerce and it's a very interesting field and it's a confluence of law as Mr. Raman was saying, law, technology, and also business. So it is now a commercial matter. So commercial courts act was passed, it was amended. And now India has IP benches. 
or IP courts to deal with IP matters specifically. There will be a bench defined, there will be judges defined, and these judges will be taking care of only of intellectual property matters. So now certainly, no, that has become expedited. But again, the concern is the benefits of Commercial Courts Act or IP division or IPD rules, which are also notified by few courts in India, a few presidency courts like the high courts in India, is only limited to few courts. It is not extended to other courts. The other courts have not been able to uh, implement this, probably because of uh, the lack of understanding of these intricate subjects. So Delhi High Court is the pioneer when it comes to implementing these uh, uh, IPD rules and uh, rolling out judgments related to intellectual property when Madras High Court. So these two are the high courts wherein you see that now the jurisprudence is evolving very fast and the enforcement is also at par with the international standards. These two high courts in Delhi and Madras. So again, like I said, it is not implemented. Jurisdiction, you know, in law, what happens? There's this forum shopping. People the litigators would ideally want to invoke a certain jurisdiction. So if another high court, for example, see uh, Jharkhand High Court, if I were to file an infringement suit in Jharkhand High Court, but I know the Jharkhand High Court is not that equipped to deal with such matters, I will try and establish my jurisdiction as Delhi High Court. So again, these jurisdiction challenges exist despite the rules and laws in place. So we, we spoke about pharmaceutical and ag agrochemical products. So again, you know, the patent is granted to pharmaceutical and agrochemical products in India. The problem is you need regulatory approval before you launch the drug in the market or launch the product in the market. So that also takes time, regulatory approvals. So there is no patent, patent term extension, unlike the US. Suppose there are five, six years which is which takes um, it, it takes less these days but then if it takes few years for uh, the regulatory approval to come so you know the you, the patent term is fixed so you lost some time before you could launch your drug into, into the market or bring your drug into the market so what happens there's no patent term extension unlike the us also you need to sur submit certain data with the regulatory approvals and what if that confidential data, clinical data is disclosed to a third party? There is no specific mechanism to deal with such cases where you can address such infringement or such unfair commercial use of that data if it is disclosed to a third party. So, you know, it is on good faith. So there is no specific act to you know, deal with such situations. Also, around 2018, uh, we had the Customs Act, which... Uh, if, if you are importing an infringing product from a different country and the product is patented or has intellectual property in India, so that will be interdicted at the customs. So patent was removed from that purview of that act in 2018. Why? Probably, like I mentioned at the beginning, patent is a very technical matter, technical subject in itself because it deals with numerous technologies, pharmaceuticals, telecommunications, electro electronics, any technology you name and you know, it will have a patent or you can file a patent on it. So it is difficult for custom officers. They are not well trained to understand a technology behind it. So that will interdict it at the stage of customs, which is probably much easier when it comes to trademarks, copyrights and other such intellectual properties, but not patent. So it was removed from the purviews. So again, you know, that is something which is of uh, concern. Again, if you talk about these are the guidelines, because in the software, I'm sure, you know, in a passing reference, everyone of us would have heard that again, uh, when it comes to granting of patents related to pure software or pure computer programs, again, that's an area which is much debated because India is, is the software companies in India are more service based and not product based. So if you start allowing softwares or programs again you know that will hurt the uh, india's interest at large so but in us it, it's not exactly the same i mean you can still get a patent on your software uh, if it's completely you know into computer program maybe you wouldn't get it but then it is the bar is much lower when it comes to granting of software patents in the us so india you know uh, has uh, something called computer related 
invention guidelines which has been you know amended from time to time what happened the last time it was amended it was amended to remove or delete the examples when wherein it was mentioned what would be patented and what wouldn't be patented so now that has left or deferred a lot of things a lot of uh, you know such uh, adjudications to the examiner or controllers at the patent office so this has uh, you know sort of now it is a matter of discretion of the patent office to decide on adjudicate whether the subject matter is fit for patents which is related to software and again when you leave it to discretion certainly you know that unpredictability creeps in so again that is something which is of concern when you talk about the you know uh, uh investment or uh, other things especially from the context of intellectual property right uh, protection enforcement and commercialization angle so again you know, that has become another uh, pain point so to speak and like i said just to extend that thought not only limited to computer related inventions but extending to other you know provisions in the act which is interpreted by the patent office by the intellectual property office by applying their own discretion which may which is debatable and so again you know that makes the system uncertain unpredictable which is again of concern of many stakeholders across the jurisdictions so so ideally uh, you know to sum up i would say uh, that these are the issues burning issues when it comes to patenting of okay there is some background noise uh madhushri ma'am can you mute yourself yes Unmute, unmute, unmute. Yeah. So we see that when you talk about intellectual property rights regime in India, the problem or the concern, although you know the intent is right, there are a lot of regulations in place, there are a lot of rules which have been amended, a lot of you know, good practices which have been now deployed, but the there are certain. problems which exist on multiple fronts be it legislative front or like i said regulatory front and also on the front of uh, from the perspective of uh, commercialization like i said uh, just to you know give a quick example of how does it affect commercialization aspects if you talk about i was talking about pharmaceutical and medical devices what happens uh, so there is there is no criteria if you apply for a manufacturing license of a particular drug or medical device there is no mandate it in fact it was removed it was deleted by an amendment there is no mandate now that you will have to submit the details related to whether that particular drug which you are applying for a license is already under patents so you need not you know supply that information to the regulatory agency there is no notification system wherein you will be informed that you know uh, regulatory approvals have been applied for follow on pharmaceutical drugs there is no notification there is no mechanism wherein the agencies you know communicate to each other so you know again that makes the system unpredictable so to speak and also it becomes difficult to enforce and commercialize those products by the right owner so so you know basically this is related to uh, the problems or the concerns and the you know developments as far as ip regime in india is concerned so since you also have uh, the lot of mba students around and so you guys might not be technologists and few of them would have done their engineering and you not know, then joined law that i i am also an engineer turned lawyer so for you i would say the only thing is that scientific temper has to develop it it's not necessary that you have to be a technologist or an engineer to probably you know uh, infuse or uh, uh, technology in every aspect of your professional career or professional uh, you know uh, realm Uh, i'll say you know you have to feel that technology is important technology is extremely important and it can it has the potential to change lives business and lot of other things and you have to strongly feel it although we we all acknowledge we know that technology is so important covid you know taught us a lot of things that innovation the pace of innovation you know really increased and, and a lot of things which are developed in that phase uh, so so we all understand that but we don't to feel it so strongly that we start implementing it in our businesses like i said It, it's not that that you have technologists in your team. You are a business person. You have done your MBA. Now you are handling a business unit. 
in your company or you have a startup and then you hire a technologist and they start doing innovation so it's not it is like any other job it's it's an art of knowing more than doing but then you have to set a process so that you know the ecosystem develops so it's a process if it's a process obviously you know you have to incorporate those sops in the place and then innovation ecosystem develops so certainly a big person with no technical background cannot say that you know i, I have nothing to do with technology and i'll not uh, help businesses grow uh, because i don't i, I don't uh, subscribe to technologies closely and uh, if if you are in a business if you join a company who is already established which which has a established product line probably you have to do sustainable in, uh, innovation the innovation should be sustaining but if you are joining a startup if you are doing something on your own or you know in your business you want to create a new business line or new product line you have to be disruptive so you know all kind of innovation goes on and you know uh, probably the best way is to have a mix of both So now I'll just end this with a, sh- a short st- uh, thing because you know we are uh, discussing India and U.S. relationships in uh, the context of intellectual property line, right? So we work with this U.S. attorney very closely uh, in the U.S. It's a, it's a huge firm in the U.S. and we work with them very closely. So recently, a few days back, he put out a post on the link on LinkedIn, and uh, and we didn't know about it, although we deal with him on a regular basis. So uh, the post was. Uh, that he was diagnosed with a stage 4 4 cancer on 2019 and uh, then he started googling up and then said you have 5 to 6 months of uh, life left and uh, so so he was disheartened and then although he was he was then undergoing treatment at a very good hospital in the US and yesterday was his 50th birthday and it's it's been you know like 4 5 years so google was wrong google was proved wrong and he he congratulated or he you know Uh, acknowledged uh, technology in part that now people can live longer even if they are you know with cancer they can live longer and uh, you know he ended this with a line that aging is not a right but a privilege so you know and, and you have to uh, sort of acknowledge the technology the role of technology and in lives and um, businesses so 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 it is important to understand that and implement it in your businesses even if you're not a technologist so yeah i would end that uh, and this on on that note thank you mr sonu uh, it was really uh, a very engaging session i would say and you gave us uh, some uh, very good relevant examples especially with regard to the drug industry uh, which in any case and you ended on on, on the drug note itself okay yeah. so it 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 was a good learning lessons for all of us maybe we'll take on some more questions uh, once we conclude and we finish with all the speakers maybe uh, i may have one question related to pharmaceutical only but we we will t- take it on at a later session now i will invite our um, second speaker uh, mr matthews vc vergis matthews mr matthews is uh, is the group head of uh, fox bundle and associates he has over 14 years of experience in the field of uh, intellectual property rights and he currently heads the firm's uh, intellectual property practice in delhi uh, mr patu he comes uh, with a very rich experience in handling varied aspects of intellectual property including trademarks copyrights and designs uh while hand holding organization through a serpentine maze of clearance searches registrations and enforcements his fervor deep legal expertise and action oriented outlook in the ip laws equip him to constructively collaborate and engage with a wide range of clients from startups to mncs across diverse industries uh, and uh, he has been working in various sectors which includes automotive consumer goods retail education food and beverages health and lifestyles you know information technology and blockchain startups i can i, I can go on and on he he's a very very regular speaker in organizations like cpam fiki etc and has served as an adjunct professor of ip at his alma mater so mr matthews has uh, has uh, that is ba llb from symbiosis law school and subsequently is llm in intellectual 
property from Queen's Mary and a diploma in cyber laws from Asia School of Cyber Laws. He has spoken extensively at various conferences and events. You know, I would say that I was just counting over 32 lectures he has delivered in just last three years in various conferences worldwide. Uh, that's phenomenal, sir. And he's also affiliated with International uh, Trademark Association, Young, uh, uh, Young Indians, Round Table India, which is International Association of Young Lawyers, as well as LES. He has over 14 publications also in various journals, which covers a wide array of subjects like, you know, IP, intellectual property in blockchain, green intellectual property, uh, digitizations of Indian trademark registry and a whole lot of other subjects. So with this, I welcome you, sir. And uh, we all would be very, very enlightened and happy to hear you on the subject of copyright. So over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Commander Raman, for uh, your kind words and for having me over. Good afternoon to one and all. Um, and thank you to the Indo-American Indo Chamber of Commerce for having a session uh, on such a relevant topic. Uh, while I'm sharing the screen, uh, there is one thing that uh, came to mind, and it's something to do with the fact that we went through a tough phase uh, a couple of years ago. And the one thing I think we all enjoyed or missed was not only person-to-person -person contact, which eventually led to forums such as what we have today on platforms such as Zoom, but also a lot of creative works that we as human beings enjoyed. And this want as human beings to be in touch with the creative side of things was to a large extent felt well, uh, where in which we were using online platforms to try to enjoy all that we as human beings used to enjoy in person, which brings us to this area of law known as copyright. Unfortunately, the terminology is a little bit misinterpreted. It is not the right to copy, if you believe that is the case. It is actually the right not to copy. There is also a copy left movement for those who are interested. So the terminologies are quite mixed up if you ask me. But nevertheless, uh, let's have some fun for the remainder of the time and enjoy what we are going to basically be looking at. I use the word creative works and I use that deliberately. As human beings, we always create something and more creation happens on the base of what is already out there in the public domain. Imagine a situation where in which somebody stole what you have created. Creation is not an easy thing to do. Um, try writing a book. I have failed miserably. I still can't do it, but I do know other people who can. And it takes a lot of time. Try writing music. Again, it takes a lot of time and effort. A lot of the personality of a person sometimes finds itself into these creative works as well. Imagine you spending so much time creating something and then your friend comes by and steals it and takes it away. Being the good human beings that we are, we may forgive our friend, but uh, if it happened the second time, we would feel sad, we would feel disappointed, maybe a little angry. And these are normal human fe feelings that each of one would have. Go back in political science, there is a theory known as labor theory. As per the labor theory, anything which is created by the labor should belong to the labor because if you do not, the labor would lose the incentive to do any work. When you adapt that theory and the thesis to intellectual property or copyrights, you would understand that it makes a lot of sense. If law did not give each of us protection in our creations, we would not have the incentive to create more. Therefore, if musicians were not protected, they would not create new music, which would then not be enjoyed by us. And this would 
largely result in all the fun going out of society, as you can call it. This is where copyright law stepped into the picture. Now, copyright law was historically linked to literary works or written works. Till the creation of the printing press, there was not much problem. Why? Because it was very difficult to replicate a book. With the advent of the printing press, you suddenly could create a book or create copies of that book. And then started the real problem of books being replicated or duplicated without authorization. And there was a requirement for some form of protection which needed to come about. Copyright is an inherent right. This basically means that from the time of its creation, the creator has a right in it. So a question may arise in your minds today, why do I need to file for something? If I, the speaker, am telling you that it is an inherent right, why should I file for it, right? And I'll come to why you should file for it later on when we talk about a little or when we touch upon enforcement, I'll come up with why it is important for us to file it. Uh, like I said, it is right not to copy. It's not the right to copy. And it basically governs a very large area. My colleague uh, Sonal touched upon computer softwares and the problems regarding patenting it. Uh, computer softwares can be filed as a copyright. The algorithm definitely can be. Uh, apart from that, literary works, musical works, artistic works, audio and video recordings, all of these compass a large area of what copyright is all about. So you would find everything ranging from music to books to PPT presentations to copyright uh, to, uh, sorry, software programs, you know, audio recordings and even movies forming this very large area of law called copyright. So in Easy sense to understand, but literary works, musical works, artistic works, audio and video recording. This is simple to understand. And this is what uh, basically covers or rather what copyright law covers or protects. And this is the kind of protection that we as creators can avail in India and not only in India, but also outside India. It was, I mean, these are just examples, but literary works can include poems, lyrics, stories, software. Artistic works include paintings, drawings, photographs, cinematographs, movies, clear to understand, right? Sitcoms, the weirdest movie shows that we watch every single night. Some recordings, songs, podcasts. Um, we were talking about vinyl recordings uh, before the session started. Those two. Dramatic works, plays, something which to a large extent is dying out today, but it is still very much existent. Uh, maybe a lot of you have read Shakespeare's plays. You never know, but these are all part of copyright protection. Musical works, music, something that each of us enjoys, something that we listen to when we are driving from point A to point B, something that we listen to when you're reading a book. It's all around us. If you actually look and think about it and with respect, every single thing on your screen is something that we as human beings enjoy and interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. We wake up in the morning, we sit down with our mug of coffee or tea, and we read the newspaper, a literary work, right? The articles are published by the Times of India or the Hindu or somebody who's written about it. We enjoy music, we drive to work, we enjoy music in our car, we enjoy podcasts, we come back in the evening, we uh, watch a movie during the day, we interact with our laptops, there is a software out there, either it's a Windows software, or maybe it's a, a Linux program, or maybe it's a Mac OS. Again, software, all copyrights, right? So we are constantly interacting as human beings with various forms of copyright on a day-to-day -day basis without actually knowing it. As a student, this might be larger and more, but as human beings and professionals, we definitely are uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, interacting with quite a lot of them. It's a bundle of rights, which basically means that if I, the creator, have a copyright in my favor, I have the right to make adaptations. I have the right to reproduce the work. I have the right to issue those works to the public. 
I have the right to make translations. I can communicate the work to the public and it's a right against copy. It's a monopoly right, of course, uh, which is given to the creator for a specified time period, which we will touch upon a bit later uh, in the uh, slide deck. Many of you have heard of Harry Potter and J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter series. Now, J.K. Rowling created the Harry Potter series of books, but there was an encyclopedia created by another person. During numerous interviews, J.K. Rowling has attributed credit to that particular person because she often used to say that that encyclopedia proved to be a boon when she used to want to refer to certain characters and certain information that she required when she was writing a new book. This particular person had created a wonderful encyclopedia in which all the J.K. Rowling characters, or, or, or rather the characters of her book, formed a part of that encyclopedia. It was an amazing piece of work. Once the Harry Potter series of books got over, J.K. Rowling sued the creator of the encyclopedia. Hypocritical, right? Because on the one hand, I said that she was praising this person and she turns around a couple of years later and sues that particular person. Court ruled in favor of J.K. Rowling. Put the emotions aside, put the moral rights aside, put what we feel aside. In the end of the day, the court ruled that the encyclopedia was nothing, or rather was a compilation of all the characters which was created by J.K. Rowling's work. Therefore, the encyclopedia lacked any form of originality which should have been there for a work to be copyrightable. The actual reason was that J.K. Rowling wanted to monetize her work and create an encyclopedia by herself and thus needed to put this person out so that she could bring out her own encyclopedia. A lot of things that is there in the world of copyrights is monetized. There is a commercial angle to a lot of copyrights and the protection that is offered or sought by creators of these copyrights. There is a difference in copyright law between the owner and an author. I could be the author of a work, but the owner of it or the applicant of that copyright would be completely different. There is a reason for this. Before self-publishing books came about, and I'm just taking the example of a literary work or a book, I, an author, could write a book, could pen it, but I would not have the resources to be able to publish it. I would have to approach a publisher like Penguin or any of the other publishers out there and request them to take a risk on me and publish my book. The publisher would turn around and say, well, okay, we are happy to kind of fund your book and put it out there and do the marketing required for the same. However, since we are putting up the money, we are taking a risk. And if we are taking a risk, then we would like to have the rights associated with that book. So I would sign an agreement with the publisher wherein which I would turn over all my rights, except something known as moral rights. I would turn over all of that, all of my copyrights basically, to the publisher who would then become the applicant or owner of that particular work. So I am the author, the publisher is the owner. Uh, in respect of a photograph, it is the photograph per itself, who is the owner, cinematograph films, a producer, literary works, the author, musical works, the composer, and the artistic work, the artist. These situations keep changing depending on whether rights are given to a publisher or a publishing house or a production house or not. So this is that one area of law where there is a slight difference between the creator and the person who actually is the owner. IACC could commission be a wannabe artist who create a nice piece of work, 
for their office walls and for X amount of money. Though I am the painter and the author of the artistic work, IACC would be the owner of that particular piece of work. These basically are exceptions to the original philosophy that the person who creates it is the author and owner of that particular work. Even in a government organization, the government becomes the owner of the work. So if I create something during my time in that particular government service, the government becomes the owner of it. Similarly, in respect of our various offices, we may tell one of our employees to kind of write articles for us for LinkedIn, uh, for our office page. And that means that we are the owners of that particular article, but the employee who wrote it, he's an author, but he's not the owner of it because he has written it during the course of his employment. Anything that I create during my time at Fox Mundle belongs to Fox Mundle. It does not belong to me, the person. So there are exceptions depending on your understanding of author and owner in respect of copyright law. Copyright law came about, like I said, because there was a requirement for protection for the creator of any of these copyrights. And it is into this particular situation or circumstance that India came out with the Copyright Act in 1957. The Copyright Act is still existent. Uh, it has gone and had certain amendments to it, obviously, because uh, it is required was required with numerous technological advances. But by and large, the basic genesis of the Act has remained the same. So you can see that it is a good piece of legislation if it has been relevant for the last 50 odd years now, right? So the filing of a copyright, and this is just in very, very brief format for those who are looking to get this filed or who want to know how it is filed. It is not a very tough process. It's a very, very simple process. You file your copyright. There is a certain set of information that is required to be submitted. Once you file your copyright, you may receive objections. You may not. I use the words may because it is not mandatory. If you receive objections, you need to file a response to the same. And there may be a hearing which is oral nature, which could be held. Again, this is not mandatory. And once the hearing is completed, the certificate of registration is issued. This is basically the simple process of how a copyright filing happens. Earlier, it used to happen in hard copies at the Copyright Office, uh, which is based in Dwarka, Delhi. But nowadays it happens online. The concept of digital India has affected intellectual property filings as well. And copyright filing happens online now with a simple digital signature that many of us may already possess. Once the copyright is filed, you have a protection time period of the life of the author plus 60 years post his death. Recently, Amitabh Bachchan wanted to protect his father's poetry and he had come out in the media stating that the protection time needs to be increased. This was because the time period for protection was coming to an end and those poems would come out into the public domain for any of us to be able to utilize it. And that is why he wanted to protect it to monetize it further. You all may have read articles also recently of a particular variation of Mickey Mouse coming into the public domain and the copyright coming to an end. It does not mean that all forms of Mickey Mouse have come into the public domain and all of us can utilize it freely. It just means that that particular version of Mickey Mouse has now completed its term of copyright protection and therefore has come out into the public domain. One of the biggest mistakes that all of us make, whether that be at office or in our personal lives, is use software to pull photographs off the internet or download photographs off the internet and utilize them in our flyers. This unfortunately is wrong and it amounts to what is on your screen right now, a terminology known as infringement. 
many years ago when I was a very young attorney, one of my first matters was basically where in which I took the Bank of India to court. Simple reason was that the Bank of India at that particular point of time used to issue calendars every year to all its customers. So in one fateful year, they had issued a calendar to a customer who also happened to be our client. My client's work was basically collation of, of photographs. So he used to basically uh, have a platform wherein which he used to collate photographs uh, of various photographers with their authorizations. And these photographs used to be taken by the Indian, Indian Express or the Hindu or India Today or the Week or any of those magazines which used to be around and be popular at that particular point of time for various articles that they were doing. And surprisingly, he found that in the calendar which was courier to his house, photographs from his website. And uh, unfortunately, for the person who created the calendar, a couple of the photographs also had the timestamp or the stamp or the watermark rather of the uh, my client's company as well. So it was not a very difficult case to prove. Uh, they had basically shot themselves in the foot by putting the photographs into the calendar. They had obviously done it unknowingly. Uh, the bank had commissioned a marketing agency to create it. And the marketing agency had you know, taken these photographs, put it into a calendar. Here is a wonderful glossy finished calendar for the Bank of India for a contract, obviously, which had money in it. But this error by this bank or by this marketing agency is something that we also kind of do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, as students, we regularly try to just save photographs online and use them for flyers that we would use creating Adobe Firefly or using Canva. We just upload it and utilize it. It could lead to something known as infringement. And this is something that we really need to be careful about. Infringement, I mean, if you commit infringement, you, the copyright owner, have options under law, whether that be filing of a civil suit or filing of a criminal suit. Uh, civil suit, it's a very simple uh, understanding. You go to court and protect your rights and hopefully get an interim injunction in your favor. Copyrights can be protected under criminal law as well. And that is something that can happen. Under the Copyright Act, uh, there is a very interesting section uh, of search and seizure. During the pandemic again, we'll go back here to this particular instance. I used to work for an FMCG company and the FMCG company happened to be Nestle. The biggest want from Nestle by all the consumers in India at that particular point of time was Maggie Mobiles. Unfortunately, due to the labor shortages, Nestle was unable to supply the retail shops or the wholesalers which, with enough number of packets of Maggie noodles. But there was a demand, nevertheless, from all of us. In stepped the counterfeit uh, into that particular scenario. And they were manufacturing Maggie noodles, counterfeit Maggie noodles, which looked very much like the exact packet on a shelf that we purchase on a day-to-day -day basis. And these Maggie noodles were there across the country. So all during the pandemic, I was traveling from state to state, um, conducting search and seizure raids uh, with the help of the bullets to take these counterfeit Maggie noodles off the shelves for a right reason. Nestle was concerned that the existence of this counterfeits would lead to health problems for us, the consumer. And they were right in their understanding. A substandard food product ingested by a human being can lead to medical problems. If there weren't enough already, it was something of grave, grave importance for them to ensure that their reputation and goodwill was not damaged by these infringing products. So. The police, under law, have the option of search and seizure. When you go to a police station and say that my copyright has been infringed, 
the first thing the police officer will ask you, you say, you show me the papers that you have, the right that you claim that you have. And this is why I said that registering a copyright is of immense importance. Though it is an inherent right, it is important for us to get it registered at the copyright registry and obtain this nice little piece of paper, which is called the certificate of registration, and keep that very, very safely so that we can submit it in proceedings where it is required to be submitted. In a civil proceeding, that piece of paper acts as primary evidence under the Evidence Act. There is something on a secondary evidence also under the Evidence Act. We will not go into that in too much depth, but this is just something that you need to understand that it acts as primary evidence in a civil suit and in a criminal suit, especially in a search and seizure action, it proves to be very, very useful when a police officer asks you for a piece of paper proving your right. The monopoly right which the Copyright Office, the Government of India has granted you, the creator, validating that it is your right and no one else's. So this is how rights are basically protected under copyright law. Uh, the term of protection, like I already mentioned, the life of the author, plus 60 years, something for you to keep in mind. This is quite a large period of time. It is important that this time period be maintained and post this, the work finds itself into the public domain. Because if you look at everything that is there out there, which is copyrightable today, it is all built on something else, which is already in the public domain. You would also all have heard of this terminology of plagiarism. This is for the students who are there in this particular session. You would have heard your professor saying, don't plagiarize, attribute credits to the relevant person. There is a reason for that. Because if you do plagiarize, which is nothing but infringement of copyright of a particular person, of his piece of work, you would find yourself in a lot of trouble. Therefore, it is not just two words which your professor is actually saying. It means a lot because in the outside world, you could get sued for plagiarizing someone else's content. So be very, very uh, wary of this particular instance. If you are both writing an article and if you are taking something from somebody else, ensure that in your footnotes, you have attributed credit as to where and from whom you have taken that particular piece of work from. You may be free to create your own analysis based on uh, two or three works which you have read and analyzed and come out with your own analysis. That analysis obviously would be yours and you would be the holder of the copyright, but that particular portion from which you based your analysis would belong to someone else. Therefore, it would be just safer and good practice to attribute credit to that particular party in the end of the day. Um, copyright law is pretty simple to understand. Uh, it is not very difficult. It is something which we are always interacting with. And uh, there is a lot of interaction as human beings which go into copyright law. The protection of it is obviously important because without that, like I said, all the fun in society would get lost. Uh, therefore, if you want to continue having fun and continue enjoying everything that gives us joy as human beings, do ensure that copyright is protected. Uh, your copyright is protected, definitely. And obviously, as much as possible, try not to infringe someone else's copyrights. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Mr. Kamara Ram. Thank you very much, Mr. Matthew. It was very, very enlightening. I particularly enjoyed it because uh, I myself have written a book. And uh, as you were speaking, uh, a lot of these things which was there in my mind, it was getting more and more clarified. So thank you very much for this very enlightening session. Uh, I'll request, uh, yes, uh, Shubham, uh, if there are any questions uh, from there, if you have any questions, otherwise we will go ahead with our uh, some questions from the audience. You have any specific questions from the students fraternity? Please unmute yourself. No, we are not able Am to. Am I audible? Ha, yes, now you are audible. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. So we got one or two questions while we were discussing. So I'll just have, uh, we have two questions regarding uh, what we discussed. So one was uh, like, 
how i mean uh, we were discussing about pharmaceutical uh, problems pharmaceutical industry and how uh, in, uh, india us are having some dispute over pharmaceutical patents etc given that india is a country where a lot of uh, medicines are needed and that to at a very cost efficient way so how does how do we navigate that challenge in india when we have a dispute going on with the companies pharmaceutical companies and uh, so second question uh, what we what we were discussing is like uh, 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 matthew sir was uh, saying about uh, copyright infringement uh, thing especially plagiarism so with the advent of technologies like chat gpt so this problem has came up a lot like we we as a student use a lot of chat gpt to uh, help with our assignments and all in that case we also don't know much like from where it is coming and how to uh, avoid plagiarism and have a novel approach so these are the uh, two questions which came up uh, from our side uh, sir i think we will we'll do one thing the first question on the uh, pharma industry i'll request mr sonal to address and then uh, mr matthew uh, he can take on the copyright i would further okay. add to that question mr sonal and that is you see jan government uh, runs this jan ashuddhi uh, program or getting medicines at a very reasonable price across the country for the poor people now if there is already many of these drugs which uh, you know i don't know whether they are there are already patents existing but would come under the purview of this i would say this program of the government as rightly he mentioned how do you you know uh, you know the government handles and uh, if you can throw some light on that you know we will be very very enlightened see uh, both the questions uh, one to my colleague from fox and mandal and uh, the question posed to me both you know uh would would be a, a matter of separate discussion because in a generative ai just to answer that i mean it will be a separate discussion and a lot of things uh, there are a lot of updates and developments on multiple fronts and the question you just posed to me as far as uh, uh, pharmaceutical patents are concerned so you see that shift i just uh, you know uh, i did not uh, uh, discuss much on the working statement which i just mentioned during my address there is a requirement at the indian patent office uh, that any uh, patent which is granted has to be worked in india worked in the sense it cannot be inactive it can be inactive but if it is inactive it is not worked it will draw it will have certain implications it will draw certain legal implications so to speak which means that if there is a patented drug it has to be worked in india there are certain criteria mentioned as to uh, what should qualify as a worked invention as a worked patent and this has been a bone of contention since many years not only from the us but from other countries to other developed nations uh, which have been importing drugs to india which have been manufacturing drugs in india for multiple ailments so you have to disclose the revenue details all this while i mean in in the working statement which is published at the in patent office so you can go there and see for example how much ship sipla is earning or the revenue or yearly revenue or annual turnover uh, for a particular patented drug by sipla or by run a vaccine or by novartis you can go see those details on the patent office website which is all published so this is always the contention and which is why you know we appear on that list i just mentioned priority watch list that is one of the reasons so slowly over the years the rules regarding disclosure of confidential information in or revenue related information in form 27 or the working statement has been diluted few days back there has been patent amendment rules which are notified and now that working statement is has become a toothless tiger now it has to be submitted only in 3 years as against it every year and the last time it was amended in october 2020 it removed the requirement or it amended the requirement that now you need not disclose the exact revenue details but only approximate revenue details would do the details of licensee also need not be disclosed 
So what happens? India has granted only one compulsory license. I'm sure you've heard of this concept called compulsory license. If the patented drug or if any patent is not worked in India, a government has the right or anyone has the right to apply for compulsory license in the interest of public. So only once that has been awarded by the Indian government or by the Indian Patent Office through the uh, you know, judicial intervention, of course. Now, and everyone, whoever applied for compulsory license used to refer to that working statement stating that this is not sufficiently worked in India or this is not in worked in India. And still, the need of the public is unmet. Need of the patients in India is unmet. So now, since this working statement has been completely diluted, how do you file a compulsory licensing statement? Certainly, the government is aligning itself with the West or with the developed nations just to increase that investment and just to increase, uh, increase innovation. So certainly on regulatory front as well, there are multiple amendments which has been done. Like I gave you an example that now this price control regulation doesn't apply to new drugs at least for five years. Although implementation is still questionable. So you know, there, there are multiple such things where we are, but you know, like I mentioned, India still is developing. There are a lot of population which obviously would need medicines at affordable costs. So certainly it will not happen overnight, but we are moving in that direction. At least this government is moving in that direction. And there are certain you know, other mechanisms, like you said, about the Jan Vishwas or uh, where you provide affordable medicines by the government. So I think that can continue to happen. But you cannot certainly apply such restrictions or such restrictions to foreign companies who are investing in India or who are importing their drugs to India so that you know disproportionate or discriminatory treatment meted out to them will certainly discourage them or demotivate them. But th these are few examples where you would see that you know even in pharmaceutical space or medical devices uh, space, this is happening that they are trying to follow what has been the recommendation and aspirations of these developed nations all these years. Although, like I I agree with uh, you that in terms of pharmaceutical and medical devices, as far as number of patent filings are concerned, with respect to medical devices, it has gone down. And when we visit our clients in Germany and the US, they'll say, well, my clients are not interested in filing medical devices uh, patent application in India because it is difficult to get regulatory approvals. So that remains the concern, but certainly it will take some time before we move towards a Resolution which will be acceptable by everyone. Thank you. Now, the second part of the uh, second question on chat GPT, how do we, you know, uh, even I also uh, many times, in fact, I'm doing a course <laughs> how to use chat, chat GPT. When you are doing this type of things, how the copyright is getting or you know, how do you do the infringement part of that? How do we take care of that? So this, uh, Soral, correct me if I'm wrong uh, on the tech front. I, I'll be touching a little bit on the tech front. So just correct me if I'm wrong on the tech front. Yeah. Um, but so there are two parts to the question. Actually, I, I, one part has not yet been touched upon. The first part is whether uh, anything created by any of the generative AIs, such as ChatGPT or Gemini or any of these things, is that creation copyrightable? First thing, okay. The answer to that is no, as of today. Okay. I know that it can even generate us patent specification if it requires to. I have not, I've only tried a very brief one, but I've never tried a more detailed uh, patent uh, draft or try to play around with it, but I know it can do it as well. So you cannot get a copyright on any work generated by a generative AI. As on today, there is also another reasoning behind it. Um, and I'll limit myself to the Indian context here. Under the copyright law in India, copyright protection can only be granted to a work which is created by a human being and a generative AI does not constitute as a human or a human. Okay, so uh, you have a problem in law itself where in which a work generated by them cannot be given a copyright. The second uh, portion 
is how do you prevent yourself from something like this? Well, honestly, you cannot. Uh, if you go back to the Korea when the internet came into uh, India, and we had a whole amount of uh, debates on would it take jobs, would it uh, eliminate a whole host of things, and so on and so forth. Uh, today we have a scenario where in which uh, that network is something that we can't do without. Literally, we can't do without the internet today. Uh, there has been subsequent huge number of developments, all of which have been patented incidentally uh, over the years. And we continue to use technology uh, immensely. When the initial printing press came about, we had a similar debate. How would we protect ourselves? Then we have the internet and the computer. We have the same debate again, but at a different time, different century. And now again, we are at that crossroads wherein which we have something new which has come about. And we are again facing the same question as to how are we going to protect ourselves? The answer is that we will protect ourselves because to a large extent, if you actually look at the work which uh, generative AI throws up, uh, and I, I don't know exactly the science behind it, so it might be a little bit better with the science behind it. Uh, it is very general in nature. You ask it to draft a, an article on or write a, write a blog post on something, it will write it, yes. But it will not have that creative impetus that a human being puts into uh, that article. Uh, so Sonal might, uh, sorry, I'm just using my colleague as an example. He might write that article in a particular way uh, with his own creative inputs. And I would write the same article on the same topic in a completely different way because we are two different individuals. We have different likes, we have different dislikes. We are completely different. The generative AI does not do that. It, it sits somewhere in the middle of the spectrum and just creates a basic draft of whatever we ask it to do. So I do not believe that that generative AI is going to replace and become a, uh, a replacement for human beings as such. Yes, it will have copyright problems. We will face it. Yes, because like you said, there are enough courses out there which teach you how to utilize it. And there will be problems associated with this form of technology as there has been in the past with other forms of technology. So we will have those problems. We will have enough infringement suits on that particular aspect as well. But I believe that there is enough teeth in the law, in the copyright law itself, to protect ourselves, to tackle the problems that this particular technology will bring forth as far as copyright law is concerned. Uh, and as to how to prevent it from happening at universities and offices and so on and so forth, I think the best way to do it is by educating staff, educating the students, and so on and so forth. I'm not saying don't utilize generative AIs. I'm saying utilize it responsibly, know when to utilize it. And that's the education that now needs to be imparted. Because if you're able to do this successfully, then we will be able to utilize technology also properly and responsibly. So we are utilizing technology right now to have this session and we are using it responsibly, right? But the same platform can be misused in a particular manner as well. But there are laws to combat that. True. So we don't have to be scared about technology. We just have to be prepared to use it responsibly. Yeah, so I just have to... Sorry, sorry. So you were saying something. No, no, I, just, I just had a footnote to what uh, my friend said. And I completely agree with him that you should not treat AI as an alien. First of all, and uh, you see, I mean, the focus is on uh, inventors and authors and uh, not much on invention and creation. So ideally, that's what is happening. And we're discussing about authorship and inventorship. And I was uh, in Delhi uh, last week uh, attending uh, IPR, international IPR con conference, conclave at the Delhi High Court. And uh, there were, you know, certain examples being uh, uh, given by the justices were the speakers and uh, like you know if you just if maybe you can just do it now if you mr raman just mentioned that he has authored a book and if you now ask chat gpt to share the book the pdf copy of the book 
uh, there will be a uh, you know message saying no, this might be a copyright violation. So you know the technology is also catching up with the laws, and they know that there's these ethical issues involved and legal issues involved. And also there was something very interesting I saw there uh, on a, on the slide uh, presentation by one of the uh, justice from the Calcutta High Court, uh, Justice Mosmi. So there was um, uh, instruction or there was a query given to ChatGPT saying that uh, the query was you need to transform Mona Lisa into a Marathi woman and a Bengali woman. And then, you know, it, it generated those images of a Marathi Mona Lisa and a Bengali Mona Lisa. And the name was Marathi Mona Lisa was Lisa Tai and the Bengali Mona Lisa was Shona Lisa. So you know, now, now you see, I mean, whether it's a copyright infringement or it, it gets into that realm. So, you know, obviously this can be discussed at length and the laws are still evolving around it. But certainly, uh, I would say uh, we are on track and at least when it comes to these technologies, we are at par with the uh, global jurisdiction or the global standards because uh, like my friend said, even US doesn't allow uh, AI generated product a copyright unless there's a substantial human intervention only the human generated content is copyrightable and not the ai generated uh, content and the same with uh, patents uh, there have been attempts before but inventors are cannot be the ai inventors cannot be named as inventors and only south africa is the only jurisdiction uh, currently which has recognized ai as inventors and in copyright uh, matthew if you, please correct me if i'm wrong there was one copyright got granted but it has now been you know revoked yes the there was a painting granted which was revoked basically uh, there was questionable after it was granted yeah and there was something on raghav also raghav very interesting case of raghav so yeah this is this is the from the legal standpoint this is uh, we had placed uh, you know currently we are placed uh, uh, i think similarly placed when it comes to other jurisdiction other established jurisdiction when it comes to generative ai and the you know demons it has unleashed so yes thank you so much for uh, you know sharing these views and you know a lot of uh, nuances as you progress uh, you come to know about it uh, i won't go into this you know we said mona lisa uh, having two different we have got only one person sitting here and i don't call him Thai or we call him Rajiv Bhai. <laughs> so Rajiv Bhai, <laughs> I, I would now request you to please come and, and deliver the word of thanks. It was a wonderful session and we all had a very, very informative, uh, you know, I would say it was a good learning experience. I, I really enjoyed it. And over to you, uh, Rajiv. Thank you so much, uh, Commander Sanjeev. And I think uh, it's been interesting to listen on infringement, copyright and and uh, trademark because I am a practitioner in the indirect taxes and I find this topic is also very interesting. So uh, well, good afternoon everyone and it's my pleasure to extend the word of thanks on behalf of the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce Jamshedpur chapter. I would uh, extend our sincerest gratitude to each and every one of you for gracing us with your presence today in the insightful webinar on legal implications for Indo-US bilateral trade. First of all, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to both our esteemed speakers, uh, Mr. Sonal uh, Mishra and uh, Mr. V.C. Matthew. You have been enlightening, you, you've really spoken in detail. I think uh, your, your presentation, your sharing, your examples were very important because for, for a layman to understand the basics about all these topics, I think with the, with the set examples you've done it, in a very beautiful, in a very insightful manner. So thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge. Your invaluable insights have provided us with deeper understanding, definitely. I would like to also extend our sincere thanks to the IACC head office team for their technical support. Uh, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Madam Madhushri, who is the consultant uh, to the Jharkhand chapter. I would like to extend our sincere thanks to uh, XLRI CPPR team led by Shubham. Thank you, Shubham, so much. All the members of uh, IACC, Jamshedpur chapter and Jharkhand, the participants uh, in this webinar. Uh, and also, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Mr. Nakul Kamani, the ex-chairman 
of uh, IACC Jamshedpur chapter. Commander Sanjeev Raman, the president chairman of the uh, IACC Jamshedpur chapter. I'm sure uh, it's been commendable on their part to organize this webinar in a very meticulous way with so many uh, people listening and participation from everyone. So uh, thank you so much on behalf of the entire IACC team. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Rajiv ji. Uh, I would like to mention because uh, uh, there is one uh, person, Dr. Joshita Davar Khamani. She is from uh, LS Davar and Company. And at first, she is the managing partner. I had first written to her. And I could see that the entire session, uh, she just left maybe two minutes back. She was here listening to the entire session and could spare so much of time uh, for the session. So I would like to thank her on behalf of I IACC also. And uh, so we, with, with this, we come to uh, closing of the session. Uh, thank you all once again. And I'm sure that in future, whenever we have uh, any more such interactions, uh, we IACC would not hesitate to approach all these uh, firms. And we would be you know, uh, very, very happy to see more such interactions with you people in future. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.